much, Michal, for this uh, exaggerated uh, introduction. And uh, so, as uh, as it was announced, I will be I will tell you uh, how to tell that something is a is a black hole. And now the uh, this is just an example of what I will tell you later. You see two photos of the photos of of an object, and uh, you can see that it could be a Schwarzschild black hole or maybe a compact star. Uh, but before uh, the title says how to tell that some, something is a black hole, we'll be talking only about astrophysical black holes, which means we'll be talking about black holes whose mass is larger than a solar mass. This, this sign here is the, the symbol for a, a, a mass of the sun. Because uh, I think everybody, almost everybody, heard about Hawking radiation that uh, Stephen Hawking, uh, it is said, has discovered that black hole can radiate. It is true, he, they can radiate, it has never been confirmed uh, by observation or, or a, a experiment, but in the astrophysical context, this radiation has absolutely no importance because, as you can see here, the Hawking temperature is 10 to the minus 8 uh, degree Kelvin for one solar mass and it decreases with increasing mass and since the, I mean it is ridiculously low temperature and since the universe is filled with uh, primordial uh, radiation whose temperature is around three uh, uh, degree Kelvin uh, Astrophysical black holes, if anything, they absorb radiation. They don't. They don't radiate. So uh, there will be no uh, no question of of uh, uh, Hawking radiation radiating black hole disappearing black hole. So the real title should be maybe how to tell that a celestial body is a black hole. Since we are, I, I am going to talk about black holes. Uh, Black holes are purely relativistic objects. So to describe them, one needs to use the concept of space-time. And in everyday life, uh, we live in space-time, but somehow we don't realize that. For example, now I'm talking from Paris, you are mostly in Krakow. And uh, what I'm saying now, my now is, uh, will be become, is becoming your now, uh, uh, four milliseconds later, uh, and all the information, oh sorry, I got the, all the information that I am sending is propagating uh, with the speed of light, if it is in electromagnetic waves, I can also, my, my uh, voice propagates in my, in my flat uh, by sound waves, so they propagate inside the the, um, the light cone. So this light cone is a very in important structure in the space-time. It is uh, on the surface propagates light and electromagnetic waves inside all the other information. Nothing can propagate outside, which in, uh, in the case of uh, exploration of Mars, it's not without uh, importance because when at the NASA center they sent a, uh, um, a signal or a comment to the uh, helicopter who is on the on the surface of the, of the mass, it takes ten minutes for the for the command to arrive, and then ten minutes for the people at the at, at, at the center to know if. Uh, it worked or not. I mean, uh, I mean, more than 10, 10 minutes to see if they, for example, uh, order the, the helicopter to start, they, they have to, uh, to wait 10 minutes, or even more. And then if they want to do something, for example, something is wrong, it's, it's going to take 10 minutes for the signal to arrive. So here you see uh, that living in the relativistic space time is important and of practical importance. So in special relativity, which is means uh, in absence of 
a gravitation, the so-called Minkowski space-time is flat, is just our normal Euclidean uh, space, with the structure taking into account that light propagates with constant uh, and universal speed. Now, if you put mass into the space-time, if you squeeze mass in a some mass by I won't I won't specify so I don't know how you do it but let's say you can squeeze mass a uh, mass m in a radius which is smaller than a, a radius r h which is between three to uh, one point five kilometers from one solar mass then you have a structure of the space time that is very different. Far from the mass, it's not very different, it's the same. Because here the gravitation is, is Newtonian and, a, and it goes like 1 over r, so, so the, the potential, the force of 1 over 1 r squared, so it's not different from, from our ordinary uh, space-time. But when we approach the mass, which is here concentrated in, in this one point, this is time, this is space. Okay, so we are moving in time. Everything is moving in time. I mean, you have you have people uh, considering uh, writing novels about people moving in time. We are all moving in time. I am now moving in time. You are you are also moving in time. You can be uh, at rest in space. You cannot be at rest in time. This is called life. In other words, so the the attraction you can see what what is the effect of gravitation it attracts the cones in it it, it tilts the, the the cones until a moment or rather a place a place and a moment because it is space time where the cone the light cone is so tilted that there is only one direction for the evolution of any causal system it is inside no signal from below the surface can go out because it would, it would have to move with the speed larger than the speed of light. So this is a black hole. This is a, such a structure. It is mass concentrated. So in, in a, such a little uh, dimension that there is no way out uh, from a, a surface which is called the horizon, the surface of the, of the, of the black hole. So this is a, a simple, but it has to be done in uh, space-time, definition or a picture of what a black hole is. It's a very strong concentration of mass and gravitation. So uh, there are two ways of seeing the black hole. One is this mathematical, the one uh, that, uh, that shows, for example, you mathematically can show how a black hole is formed. So you see that matter is, for example, here is collapsing. It, 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 this represents in space-time once more the collapsing matter. It's a sphere of matter collapsing. And then it, it, it crosses the surface where it becomes a, a black hole. So you, it is how a black hole is formed. I'm not going to talk about this structure here. This is, comes from the original paper by uh, Roger Penrose, who got the Nobel Prize. I, I will talking. I will talk about it in a moment for the, his work on the on the uh, uh, black holes. Here it is also a classical image from. Oops, sorry. I, I got some message and I had to click on that. I don't know why. Okay, so this is another picture from a, a Hawking and Ellis book that shows it's a space time representation of two black holes that are merging. And you can see it looks like a sort of a sort of trousers. Two black holes merge, they always merge, forming another black hole. You cannot destroy a black hole. Two black holes when they merge, and we'll see later how it works in practice because now we are observing it in gravitational waves. So this is a merger of uh, two black holes. In astrophysics, quite often, especially astrophysicists, most of them don't really know general relativity and cannot understand uh, such drawings, 
they think of black hole as a black sphere that swallows everything. And you will see, I will show you, is even this picture is, is a bit naive. I mean, certainly it's naive, but it, sometimes it's not, it's not sufficient. So black holes are now a, say part of the, I wouldn't say everyday life because fortunately they are not, but they are part of our sort of civilization, I say, because they, they got, there was a Nobel Prize for black holes and it, it, it was split in two. One part of the black hole uh, was given to uh, Roger Penrose, an eminent British physicist and mathematician, or rather mathematical physicist, and the motivation was for the discovery that black hole's formation is a robust prediction of general relativity. And then the second, prize, second part of the prize was given to Andrea Gess, an American astrophysicist from uh, UCLA, and Reichen Genzel from the Max Planck Institute in uh, Garching. And it was for the discovery of a supermassive compact object at the center of, of our galaxy, which I found, found it very strange uh, because apparently Penrose has shown that black holes are a robust prediction, but their observation found only a supermassive compact object. It looks like the Nobel Committee was not clear if what they say in the first, uh, in, 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 in the motivation for the other prize, for the half of the prize is true. And in fact, what they say was wrong. In fact, uh, Penrose have, has not discovered that black holes are a robust prediction of generative of relativity. What, what Penrose did was to prove a theorem, and in fact, he got the Nobel Prize for the theorem, that it, a theorem is simply says, if the energy density of a collapsing matter is positive, which in practice means that the, the gravity for this matter, attraction, gravitational attraction is, uh, it, it is, gravity is attractive, okay? Uh, mass attracts and not repels, and a trapped surface forms, then a space-time singularity must occur. But the singularity is not a black hole. Singularity is a place uh, in the space-time where uh, our knowledge of physics uh, is no longer valid because everything gets infinite. Pressure, uh, uh, density, uh, all other physically measurable uh, quantities become infinite. So it is a singularity. And what is a trapped surface? This we know, this is a surface on which the light cones are tilted, like I've shown you on the, uh, showing the black hole in the, in the, in the first diagram. So what Penrose has proved is the existence of a singularity. Now the problem is, is the singularity covered by a horizon and then if you have to do it with a black hole or not? And in fact, what Penrose did, he did consider a case when, when a, 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 an ensemble of stars uh, collapses for some reason. And then he analyzed, would they form a, uh, a horizon covering the, in, the inside singularity? But his conclusion was in fact a question does there exist a cosmic sensor who forbids the appearance of naked singularities, closing each one in an absolute event horizon? Which means, are black holes really universal? We don't know. We don't know. Mathematically, it is very difficult to prove because we know counterexamples. And uh, so mathematically, it has not been proved. In practice, I think, uh, there are good reason to believe that there are no naked singularities in the universe, except for the for the primordial Big Bang singularity, but this is different. And uh, from the point of view of astrophysics, I would say, one well, shouldn't be bothered with that on everyday basis, but somehow be behind in your mind, you have, you have to know that there is 
a possibility that naked singularity exists. But uh, I'm going to talk about black holes. And black holes, in black holes, the singularity is inside, is of no astrophysical interest because you can never see it, you can never get any information about it. All right, so let's start first with the uh, easiest question, is easier question, how to tell that something is not a black hole? Because you have binary systems in which you have a star losing its mass and uh, this mass, this mass is lost from a so-called accretion disk because of conservation of regular momentum, it can all fall readily inside. And in the middle, you have a black hole or a neutron star. And so the question is how to tell the difference? How to tell it's a black hole and not a neutron star? So the, is, the answer is that if you see X-ray bursts, this is what you see in the X-rays. An X-ray burst, we know for sure it is a helium thermonuclear explosion on the surface of a neutron star. We are saying an explosion on a surface, it means the same as it is not a black hole. And there are also X-ray pulsars, uh, there are pulsating sources, this is magnetic field, which is attached on the surface of the neutron star, once more attached on the surface, is not a black hole. This is a very unusual object, it's both a pulsar and a, uh, an X-ray burst, it's very rare. Usually it's something is either a pulsar or a, a X-ray burster, but this means it's certainly not a black hole. But now we have to ask the, the main question, which is uh, more difficult, how to tell that a celestial body is a black hole. This is done in practice. I'm going to tell you not about the philosophy of the, of the, of the uh, problem, but about how it's done in practice. It's done by exclusion. If it is more massive than the competition, something that we suspect could be a black hole, then it, we say it's a black hole. It is more compact and it, uh, then we also say it's a black hole. If we can prove the absence of a surface, then we say it's a black hole. Now, if, the, if we could measure the trajectories of matter or light around the object that we suspect to be a black hole, and if there are those of the Kerr solution, because we know there's a uniqueness theorem that every black hole must be a solution, a Kerr, so-called Kerr solution of Einstein equation, then we, uh, we say it's a black hole. Now, uh, we can observe gravitational waves from merging black holes, and this is a very robust prediction of uh, general relativity, and the general relativity uh, predicts exactly what the signal should be, then we know it's a black hole, and then it is what is called multiple moments. We, in the future, I will tell you, it was my last slide, we will, I will, I will be able to to um, make the black hole sort of ring and, and check its internal structure. And we know that a black hole has no interesting, it's, it's very simple, it's the simplest object that can be. So if you find a complicated internal structure of a body, we suspect it's a black hole, it is not a black hole. We also know, uh, this I, I have to tell you, uh, that no realistic celestial body can be a source of the care solutions. So if we found a, a rotating body and uh, we know it's, it corresponds to the care solution, it, it, it must be a black hole. All right, so uh, the first criterion, which is the, the oldest and has been used. The, we here we have a uh, X-ray binary, and we are asking the question, is it a neutron star or a black hole? We are saying now that a compact body with a mass larger than three solar masses is a black hole. So the, the question is why? The answer is because we know from the studying the neutron star that the masses, that the maximum mass of the uh, neutron star cannot be larger than three solar masses. Okay, the, the, the main argument is that a 
neutral star with a mass larger than Switzerland masses would have signals, propag sound signals propagating with a speed larger than the speed of, of, of light, which is impossible. So you get, I put this formula just to, to show you that it's serious. Uh, you, think you could get up to maybe four solar masses, but no more. So, uh, in fact, based on this criterion, black holes have been observed already in the 70s and 80s. There are two types of X-ray binaries, main times when it is high mass X-ray binary, the companion is of high mass. It's a very, high, very, very massive star or low mass X-ray binary when the companion is a low mass star. And then we are talking about black holes, but we can use Kepler laws. This is a simplified version of the Kepler law. And if we know the orbital period, this we know always because we, are, we are know it's a binary. And if we can measure, which is more difficult, but also can be measured, the orbital speed, then we know the mass, at least one mass of the in the in the system. So we are using Kepler's law to find black holes. And already in 1974, the great Polish astronomer, he has sh sh shown that the mass of the black hole of the compact object in Cygnus X1 is larger than 9.5 solar masses. So, frankly, this was the first uh, observation of a black hole. Now we know last year there was a paper that measured it uh, with great precision. The mass of this object is 21 solar masses, of course, in agreement with uh, the result of Pachensky, who said that this was the minimum. So we have a 21 solar mass. And then there was another system, which is which is with this name, with a low uh, mass companion. And then in uh, whatever it was, 1886, uh, Ron Remiro and Jeff McClintock has, has presented the measurement of the mass, which I'm not going to go to details, but the, the robust result was that it exceeds 7.3 solar masses. So I don't know why they didn't get the Nobel Prize earlier. Now, unfortunately, uh, Bogdan Paczynski and, and Jeff McClintock are no longer with us. Uh, they, uh, uh, they died uh, before the possible recognition. But I think, and I'm not the only one, that they were the first to discover, to observe black holes. Okay, so this is now the situation from there are even more of black holes in our in our galaxy. There are the companions of various size, masses are from what you will see, they are from a, a three solar masses. Sometimes you don't have a measurement. So this the red ones are the masses, and you see these are the error bars. This is the uncertainty of measurement, but you see clearly a difference between the black symbols that are neutron stars, confirmed neutron stars, and you can you could make this histogram here. There even seems to be a mass gap between neutron stars and black holes. So there's, there are different, there are certainly two different classes of objects, and based on the mass, uh, we, we know they are not neutron stars, we say they are black holes, but as you know, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Uh, we, they don't have a surface, they don't show the presence of a surface, but the fact they don't have a surface, uh, they don't show a surface, they don't know that they don't have a surface. So it is more complicated to find some, something that doesn't have a surface. What are the alternatives to neutron star and black holes? They are so-called strange stars that are quark stars, they are stars made of quarks, it's not clear if they exist. But they are not a competition because the maximal mass is, is no more than two solar masses. They are sort of artificially made, I would say, to Q stars. You have to realize, if you don't, that the, in, the, the central part of the neutron stars is composed of matter of, that is compressed above the nuclear density. 
the nuclear density is the is the is the largest density we can we can study in the in the laboratory. Uh, since they are they are squeezed by gravity, this this matter is 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 denser, and we we don't know much about its its, its, its properties. So people are speculating, and they are they are, they they create so called Q stars. They could have at the maximum uh, uh, masses up to 10 solar masses, but then you would have to assume things about about the nuclear matter that are not realistic. So I would say there is no realistic or quasi-realistic competition. Uh, there was also an argument by my friend Ramesh Narayan who claimed that since you don't observe uh, you never observe X-ray birds from the surface of black hole candidates, it means they don't have a surface. But this is not really a proof because matter that accumulates on a strange star, on a star which is not a neutron star because this 10 solar mass object cannot be a neutron star because they don't exist, could undergo a, a transition and become this strange matter that from the star, it is possible, it is theoretically possible, and then after this transformation, there will be no nuclei in this matter, and no nuclei, there are no thermonuclear reactions. So, uh, it's let's say it's an open question, but there's no serious uh, argument except uh, for, the, for the mass itself, uh, for the presence of black holes. But there is also no alternative. So this is by exclusion. So now we go to something to, to, to another another argument, which is by uh, the mass in a in a size. This is for supermassive. Supermassive it means uh, millions or to billions of solar masses. And this is what the second half of the Nobel Prize was given. Uh, this, this is an observation that we performed by the European VLT in Chile. It's four uh, 8.2 meter telescopes and the Keck 2 10 meter telescope in Hawaii. And since 2018, the, the, the four telescope work in the interfer interferometric mode that I will mention in a moment. So they are in interferometry equivalent to a 134 meter telescope. Okay, so what are we, what are we observing? What are they observing? They're observing the center of our galaxy. And so you see the, the, the center of our galaxy in various resolution. This is in parsecs. You multiply roughly by three and you have light years if you, uh, if you prefer light years. So you can go measure the, the observe with higher and higher resolution. And then when you arrive to 12 hour second, you see that in the center, there is a radio source called Sagittarius a star which is the center of our galaxy and around there is a, 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 a there are stars also L stars that are there's a cluster of stars that are uh, surrounding this and this is this cluster we are they're observing this is observed because of the of the uh, small resolution and the fact that we observe from Earth, from the so so there is atmosphere uh, above the telescope. This is used both in the states, uh, in Hawaii and in Chile. It was used the uh, adaptive optics. I'm not going to go into details. I don't have time and even the competence. You have on the right here the result of adaptive optics. So this this is the image that comes from the star is corrected by measuring the light of an artificial star, it's a so-called guide star, and this is corrected by com comparing the lights of the star and the artificial star. This is all used by, by uh, it is done all by using computers. This is enormous machine, 
and uh, this allowed very very uh, high resolution and since 2018 in Chile with the VLT so when using interferometry interferometry the principle is very simple you have two telescopes you measure the uh, the light from the star it must be must be monochromatic must be coherent so you have to select the wavelengths you do it for the observing the the center you have the galactic center you have to do it in infrared because all the other wavelengths are absorbed and then so they come these are waves and then you can combine the light they came at slightly different phase and then combine they form the form an interferometric pattern uh that you probably all seen at school uh, the young experiment and etc so but from this pattern coming from this two telescope you can reconstruct an image with very high re resolution and this depends on the baseline of the with of the of the distance between the two telescopes here in chile in vlt at ESO, they are using four eight meter telescopes and they are combining them all uh, in, so that have six uh, baselines and th this is done with an instrument called gravity that uh, is shown here and i will show you i don't have much time but there's a fascinating movie showing how it works i will go so this light is coming on earth uh, to the telescope So first, it is it is goes through the adaptive optics phase, and then when it is finished, which will take some time, then the the light, the the clean sort of light of the four telescope is combined, as is shown here, is combined by gravity to produce an interferometric pattern. I mean, you, if you look at that and, and you see the, the path of the, of the light is going, uh, you see, I, I, I'm just showing fragments of that because I don't have time, but it is fascinating with the, all, the, all these measurements that go into that to, to, to produce, in the end, an interferometric pattern. These are the interferometric fringes from which you can reconstruct the image. So. This is the result, uh, which is equivalent to a 174 telescope. You get this, and from this, you get very, very precise measurement of the, in this case, what we are interested in is the position of the star to measure its, there's even some, some music I see. So this you, you will, I have to show you that because it shows the the fantastic uh, performance of this. This is a reconstruction of the real observations of the of the of the galactic center, and this is the best you can do now, and, and, and they won't even. They want to improve it so you see this is one light month so very close we are going to to get to one uh, light day and you see stars you see there's there are stars moving there are plenty of stars they have their numbers they should be somewhere this is s2 this is our hero this is the Nobel prize star let's go here I will go to the next slide because uh, I don't have time for more. This is the orbit of the S2 star. The S2 star comes, it's called S2, the Americans call it SO2. It's come very close to the black hole. It comes here. This is the black hole. This is the black hole. It has a 14-year a, a orbit and it comes very, very close. You can it has been measured now there are two or three orbits you see the progress during the years and this uh, measurements allows 
even the measurement of general relativistic effects on the S2 orbits. That happened in 2018 when, 2018 when gravity was already serving. This is the black hole. This is the orbit. This is the closest approach of Cobo Present Center. Here, the speed of the of the star is already relativistic. It's 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 two percent, almost two and a half percent of the speed of light. It allows the closeness allowed to measuring the red, gravitational redshift. The light of the star is is uh, shifted to the red because of the gravity of the black hole, and also it allows measuring the fact the the, the non-closeness of the orbit which is the same effect as the as the as the moving of the perihelium of the mercury what's been observed was the first observational conservation uh, confirmation of the einstein theory it was the uh, perihelium of mercury the movement of the perihelium, perihelium of mercury this can be measured also in our galactic center so this is, is uh, uh, absolutely uh, fantastic. As you can see, I'm very enthusiastic about that. And what is the latest result about the galactic center? We have the mass, which is 4.26 million solar masses. We can measure with, I'm, I don't have time, I'm afraid to, to tell you that, but we, we can say now with certitude that the uh, the uh, radius of the of the black hole of sorry of this supermassive compact object is less than uh, three uh, uh, radii of the of the black hole. So you, if you want to squeeze something into into that uh, into that volume here, it has to be something very similar to a black hole. We don't there's there are object called uh, 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 boson stars that never, never been seen, but they uh, have other problems. If you uh, if you ask me a question about boson stars, I will be happy to answer because I want to go now to the something you've seen in the media, and this was on the front page of I think all uh, journals and uh, uh, web pages of various sites. There was the a EHT image of M87. It was advertised as a as a picture or a photo of a of a black hole. So the what was observed was the center of a galaxy uh, called M87. The center now is called M87 star. M87 is a is a giant galaxy uh, in the Virgo uh, uh, constellation. But of course, constellation don't have a a distance is, is just a position on the sky and has been observed there's a jet that's been that's been uh, observed for a long time in uh, in radio uh, this is also in the various radio frequencies and then in the millimeter wavelength uh, was observed i mean not this i will, I will show you the moment what was really observed this is a reconstruction in fact and this is i think two or three uh, light days, so it is very close to the center of this object, whose mass is uh, three billion solar masses, non independently of that. But what was really upset was this. Now, what is this? It was advertised as a photo of a black hole. Okay, this was observed by just to tell you, I'm not also by interferometry, but here the interferometer is uh, spread on the whole globe and you cannot do the same thing as you do in the, with, with the VLT. The light is recombined, but recombined by computers, of course. So you have this millimeter telescopes in various places on almost poles, uh, I mean, not almost close to the poles and in Europe and on the Pacific. And the light is recombined to, found, to, uh, to find the picture, or to create the picture I've shown you on the previous slide. Now, just uh, tell you what is what, to, to understand what is observed, you have to realize that trajectories around black holes are 
close to the black holes are not like we used to. They, for example, you cannot go on a on a circle as close as you want to the black hole. Uh, if the re retrograde, if if the, re the rotation is counterclockwise to the to the rotation of the black hole, then there are no orbits below this orbit. Now, if with no rotation, this corresponds to three radii of the black hole. For prograde rotation, in the same sense, you can get as almost as close as you want to the black hole. This is for matter. Now, the trajectory of lights they are bent uh, by the by the black hole, and as close you go to the black hole, they are more bent, and some can be bent and then go around the black hole. There is a circular orbit, photon orbit around the black hole. It is unstable. So you cannot have a, you can have light going on there indefinitely, but this is an attractor for light rays. And uh, you can have, you can have orbits that's going, uh, photons going around, around and then leaving. And then of course there are those who are swallowed by the black holes. So, if you now you plot, you make a plot of a light trajectory of black hole, you get this very complicated, there are various complicated, um, uh, I mean, they're not complicated, but the diagram is complicated. There are various types of, of light. And if you ask you, yourself a, a simple question, this is, the, uh, this is the photon orbit. Imagine you took you, you take a black hole and you put it in front of a bright, uniformly lighted uh, uh, screen. What you would see? Naively, you would see you would think you would see the black hole. Not so. This is what you would see. You would see what is called a black hole shadow. You would see a, a in fact, you would see two black black uh, circles. Uh, some people call this the shadow, some other call it black this the black shadow. Now you don't you don't see anything at the at the uh, with the radius of the black hole, which in this unit is 2m. So uh, it's, it's somewhere here. This is because what you see is through traject, what you see is the light that's coming to your eye, to your camera, and this light is making very complicated movements, and it's uh, it is it gets swallowed uh, by the by the and, and uh, def deflected by the by the black hole. So, in fact, what you see uh, this, then you see some of the light that make one this this light make this radio this uh, photons make made uh, if I remember well one turn around the black hole. And in fact, if you had if you could see very, very well, you will see more such uh, rings, light rings, but simply there are not many photons that makes two or three, four or five uh, rotation around the black hole. But you would see, in fact, in reality, I mean, not in reality, in theory, in reality, you see that. Uh, you would see that. In, in theory, you would see uh, many more uh, uh, rings. So you don't see really the black hole. Okay, you see something called the shadow. And now the question is, do you really see a black hole or you see something else? And with, uh, there, there, was, there was a paper uh, last year by Frédéric Vincent and, and collaborators, I was among them. Then we showed that if you take, for example, like an accretion disk that is radiating, is a source of photons, that is, it should be also here. It, it, it is surrounding the, the, the black hole. Then if you produce the image of a, a body, which is a black hole, a boson stars, which is a, a imaginary, but you can uh, object, but you can calculate light uh, around it. Then you, you don't see really the difference if you take the resolution of the of the photo. You don't see the difference between this and this. The same if you take a wormhole, which is another uh, fantastic uh, 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 object. Uh, it is too early to tell that we have seen a black hole. In the future, yes, it will be possible. 
Okay, and now is the I, I came to the end of my of of my talk, and this is the latest way of detecting black holes. Uh, for the first time, it was done in 2015. These are gravitational waves from merging black holes. So there are three. Now there are the, the fourth one, but he has not yet observed anything. So there are two LIGO interferometric detectors in United States. Uh, this is in uh, Louisiana, this is in Washington state, and there is one near Pisa, which is, uh, which is European, or originally was French, Italian or Italian French. And they detect signals from uh, uh, merging black holes. This is from the recent, a few days ago, My, we said, for some reason, my, my mic was out. Okay, so now, so they publish this picture, which shows the result of uh, mergers of black holes. So two black holes, as I said, form a third black hole. So these are the two original black holes. This is the final black hole. So you see, they arrive to very high masses. And uh, they are plotted together with what they call electromagnetic black holes, the one that were uh, identified as, a, as black holes uh, by in uh, X-ray binaries. And these are the neutron stars. And you can see if you look closely that this is a neutron star, but here it is half a neutron star, half a black hole. It's simply we, uh, I will tell you a little bit more in a moment. We, they are decided to be black hole or neutron star on the criterion of the mass. And here they are just, this I think is two point, this one is 2.6 solar masses. It's not clear, is it a black hole or is it a neutron star? It's a bit heavy for the neutron star, but it's below three solar masses. So we have all these black holes and they are considered to be black holes because they are all, all those guys here are above five solar masses. So, so the, the opinion is what else it could be. There must be black holes and they are up, up to uh, 170 or 180 solar masses. Now, how do you, how do we, how do we know, what do we observe? You, these are the various binaries of black holes, and this is the signal that is that is being registered at LIGO Virgo. Okay, so so what will you observe? This is the color strain. What is measured also by interferometric methods at LIGO Virgo is the distance between two mirrors. These mirrors the distance is moving because of the passage of the of a, a gravitational wave. So this is this in practice is the distance between these mirrors, and it oscillates because this is the in, the, in its parallel phase. The the two black holes are coming together. They are the fact the fact the first black hole black hole observed. So they get closer and closer. Then they merge forming a deformed black holes that last for a very short time and then they so-called ring down the final black holes oscillates uh, uh, and then becomes a uh, a curved black hole so they you can this signal is detected by by using templates and so this this gray light is the template that is calculated, assuming it's a black hole. And from this, you can measure the masses and the, and the other properties, depending on the quality of the signal of the, of the two black holes. And this is the, what is calculated by numeral, numerical relativity. And in this case, uh, you can see it is, it, it, it is ideally corresponds to two black holes with, the, I don't remember the masses now, 
30 and, and 26 solar masses. So this is a, a proof that everybody was waiting for, for uh, the presence of black holes, of two black holes merging for me one black hole. Now, is it? It, it will be my, I'm, 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 I'm almost finished. Uh, there could be some exotic compact object that were calculated especially for this purpose. And they could have a surface. They could be more compact. They are made of matter that we don't know if they exist. They probably doesn't exist. But they are made just, just to test general relativity. So they could be below this. And then you could have, when two black holes emerge, you could have also gravitational waves reflecting from the surface. And then you can calculate what you would see in the signal. You would see the, the main signal and then you will see the echoes. The echoes, the reflection of the surface. This has been tested until now and no echoes have been found. Okay, this depends on the quality of the signal, etc. But for the moment, there is no, no echo to very high, uh, very high quality. There is no echo. So we observed black holes for all practical purposes. We are happy to observe black holes. Now, if one day one finds echoes, then it will be great. It will be a great thing. But I don't believe this will happen. And uh, in the future, there will be launched in uh, 2030 something, a gravitational wave detector on an orbit, which uh, will be very far from the, uh, from the Earth and from the, will be following the Earth. His somewhere should be the Earth. And this is made to observe low frequency gravitational waves will be coming from large black holes, which mean very massive black holes. And now if you have a small black hole, so it's on you to start surrounding a supermassive black hole, it will generate small oscillations of the black hole. And this will be, will be able to, to check what is inside the black hole. If there is, if it is a black hole, there's nothing inside. Uh, but there's a way, I, I just written this equation not to explain to them, but to show you there is a, there is a formalist to check it. Does a black hole that is oscillating have a internal structure or not? You can test it. If not, it is a black hole. If yes, then it will be a very interesting problem. So I am finished with a, a Quote a question, since I, I told you that, uh, I mean, you could, you could see that I don't really believe in those exotic uh, compact objects well, and that, that are supposed to be competition for black holes that are a solution, exact solution of the Einstein equations. So is it a waste of time? Then I have a quotation from uh, Jim Pibble, a uh, Nobel Prize winner, uh, that gives, I think, a very good uh, uh, justification for this effort. We are simply trying to do good science and you could not, you should not do, and you are not allowed to do good science by uh, using your prejudices. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, it is now time for questions. Let me remind that one could ask questions just simply by switching on his or her camera and asking question directly or typing to the, to the chat. Uh, maybe to start, I can ask one question which may be for a number of uh, of people in the audience because you use terms of of uh, Kerr uh, metric or a Kerr black hole, and I I believe that uh, maybe we have even few people who don't know Schwarzschild black hole uh, notion. So maybe you could say a few words about the difference and the meaning. Yes. Uh, so this is I I think I 
I mentioned that in uh, en passant, but uh, what uh, I, I, I just said also in my conclusion, black holes were in fact discovered uh, as solutions of the Einstein equation before they was realized what they are and they could be a physical object. And so they are a prediction of, a, in the sense, they are a prediction of general relativity, the first exact solution of the Einstein equations. And they are very complicated nonlinear equations. It was found by Carl Schwarzschild, an astronomer, by the way, uh, immediately after the publication of the uh, of Einstein equations. And so Carl Schwarzschild found a solution that was found later to be representing a non-rotating black hole. And it's been taken years, uh, almost half a century to understand what a black hole is, but this was a solution. And then uh, in, the, in the 70s, Roy Kerr, a New Zealander a mathematician found a solution that representing that was representing was understood representing a rotating black hole, and now several uh, physicists and uh, mathematicians has proved, and this is the information probably I, I missed, that any or every black hole that is stationary, I mean, which is relaxed, is not oscillating, is just left alone, must be represented by the Kerr solution. There are no other solutions representing black hole. And Schwarzschild is a Kerr solution for non, I mean, it's a non-rotating Kerr solution. So a black hole, if it's a black hole, must be a Kerr solution uh, of the Einstein equation. This is the uniqueness theorem, so to say, and it is mathematically been proven by, uh, it took a long time and uh, the many people took in part of that. I mean, since, since we are, uh, since I am presenting this at, in, at the Uagulian University, one of the final touches was made by Pavel Mazur, who did his P PhD at the Jagiellonian University long time ago now, but uh, he made a very important contribution to that. So there is a, a Polish touch to that less. Yeah, so uh, please let you indicate me, uh, if people from the audience, if you would like ask a question, I, uh, before someone decides to ask, I, I have also another question uh, related to, uh, to my feeling after uh, uh, learning about the first black hole uh, uh, um, uh, coalescence and uh, possibly also many others and also this plot which you were showing where two black holes joined to form the more heavy one. And uh, it, it was observation that uh, the heavy one was not some uh, mass, was not some of the masses of the smaller one. And it looks like maybe a significant fraction of the original mass, some five or 10% of the mass could be radiated at, as gravitational waves. It is extremely efficient emission of energy uh, from in, in cases I know in astrophysics. Could you comment on that? Yes, yes, yes. I did, you know, I had so many things to say. This is a very good, uh, uh, good question and comment, in fact. In fact, these are the most powerful events in the universe because, as you, as you remarked, I didn't, I should have stopped on that, but then it would take too long, too long time that the, the final mass of the black hole is not the sum of the masses of the two black holes. And in many cases, uh, it depends, of course, on the on the mass ratio of the of the black hole. But in many cases, uh, a large fraction of the of the rest mass of the black hole, uh, up to thirty percent, if I remember, can be uh, radiated away from gravitational wave. And this is this paradox because locally, when you when you locally, if you were with this black hole. It better not to be too close, but but if you if you see that it, it's 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 an enormous energy release. 
but they are so far away that when they come to Earth, you have to use the most refined technology to detect them. Yeah. But they are the most powerful uh, events uh, that we observe. Uh, but we, we, since there are two black holes, we can observe them only in gravitational waves. So we cannot, we cannot see them in, in area. This, this is the frustration. So now we are waiting for questions. I think one can ask also simple questions if you don't understand something. Look, I was, I was educated, as Michal mentioned, in, uh, in Warsaw, the Institute of Theoretical Physics. I was participating in this Leopold Infeld seminar, and there was a motto there on the, for everybody, especially students, to see there are not stupid questions, there are only stupid answers. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you very well. Uh, it's, quite, it's quite unfortunate that I cannot put on my uh, camera, but my, my picture is there. Um, uh, firstly, I wanted to thank you for your presentation, which was uh, touching. And uh, for some of us, we are not coming from that background. Uh, you gave us a good background on um, this uh, topic that you are giving us. But my question, um, as someone who is uh, trying to understand this, uh, do we have like um, scientific papers that have been uh, written and um, kept somewhere? Uh, maybe in journals that we can also go and visit and uh, try to uh, digest these from a scientific point of view or from yes. a proper point of view. Yes, of course, there is there's a, there is a, a large literature. If if uh, I mean, if it is convenient, I could send to uh, to to uh, Professor Ostrowski uh, some additional uh, uh, literature to to read uh, on the on the on the subject. There's plenty of literature on that, of course, on various levels and uh, various level of tech. The, you know, technicity, etc. So there's there, there's no problem with that, of course. I mean, it's, it is true that uh, in in 50 minutes or whatever I took, yeah, in 50 minutes to to cover all that, I, I in fact, I'm in a sense I made a mistake. I should have cut one of them, but I I am so enthusiastic about the the observations. I'm a tourist myself, uh, so maybe that's why. But I thought that I, I have to show you everything was been done because it is it is a fantastic example what you can do uh, with technology combined with theoretical approach because one would not work without the other. And uh, and I, I so I am impressed both by the theory, but less because I am a tourist myself, but but uh, I wanted to show you what you can do uh, nowadays with instruments, electromagnetic, in electromagnetic waves, because I've shown in infra infrared and in, uh, in, in radio waves, and also with the new, this is a new astronomy uh, that has existed only for six years, which is the gravi gravitational wave uh, astronomy. So we are new in the, you know, I don't like such pompous word, but I think we are, we are, we started a new epoch. No, but I suggest that maybe you could send me a few references to more popular. Uh, yes, yes, of course. Yeah, sure. And we could put this list on the web page so people yes. like me could, could have a look into the into yeah. abstract of your talk and there will be also information about, about yeah. references. Especially especially that I I wrote for I co-wrote a, a, a book, a popular book about gravitational waves that been published in French and in Polish, but uh, not in English. But of course this also there are certainly people reading Polish in the audience and uh, so okay, I will we'll we'll talk about it, and I will I will send uh, references. So, so uh, uh, nobody is leaving, and nobody is asking questions. Uh, so please do don't don't be afraid. Uh, you don't even have to show you uh, your face or. Uh, 
So maybe I will ask a question. First of all, ah. thank you very much for the lecture because it was very interesting. But thank uh, you. What you mentioned uh, about this uh, taking of the picture of the back hole was the methods of interferometry, right? So I would like to ask you because all that you mentioned was uh, with the use of uh, radio waves. Is there any chance for having this kind of interferometry using the visible light? Sorry, the, I didn't. I, I didn't get the last. The last word. Hmm. I, I'm. Um, I'm asking about uh, taking this interferometric. Uh, yes. Astronomy to the realm of visible. I think it was, there was misunderstanding because in the talk there were presentations of VLT interferometer which operates in visible light, not radio. Yeah. Okay. No. No. Sorry. Okay. Now I get the question. Yeah. The uh, the the VLT. Okay. The the oldest interferometer is in radio waves because it is the uh, the simplest in a way because of the wavelength and uh, it's, it's more complicated because you have to use computers for the very large uh, baseline. But what I uh, showed uh, the VLT, VLTI, this is in infrared, it's, it's optical, yeah, but it is, it is at, at, at uh, 2.2 microns, so it is, it is uh, infrared. Now there is there is a possibility and it exists with smaller telescopes. Uh, uh, we are using, I mean, they are using uh, infrared because it's the only wavelengths you can see the galactic center in. Because the galactic center is heavily absorbed, uh, so you cannot see it in optical this way. Uh, but uh, there is, uh, there are stars to be resolved with optical interferometry. There are projects of uh, using uh, UV, ultraviolet technology. And I know some 10 years ago, 15 years ago, there were serious projects and then we dropped for some reason, probably technological rather, to do uh, X-ray interferometry in space, of course. So interferometry can be done in, you know, these are waves, okay? So the, 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 the challenge is, is technological or technical, technological, but when you have waves, you can always, you know, inter they will always inter interfere. And uh, so the, the uh, as, as, as you said, the radio interferometry is the one which is, which is used very frequently. The, the optical interferometry has been used and they, they, they are infer, but they are used mostly to resolve stars. But they are, they are some quite, quite, uh, quite impressive. Uh, I'm not, not sure that they are scientifically so interesting, but it's a question of the future. But here, what uh, what was new and different was it was used for astrometry. It was not used to resolve a, a object, but to determine the position of a star, which is called astrometry, with the highest possible precision. And so this this was innovative, but on the other hand, they also, they use these two stars, but they also use the same technique, uh, I'm not sure they use the same technique, but they certainly use adaptive optics to determine the position of, of some infrared flares. There, there are some gas flaring very closer to the black hole. And also you can determine its position. I'm not sure it has been done. I think it's been already done with, with, with gravity. So here it is, a, it is something which is also used quite often in uh, radio interferometry to determine the the, the position. Uh, but I think it's only a beginning. Yeah, and I didn't give you the whole the whole information because I was talking about about uh, Sagittarius A star, but also the the VLTs are in a different mode of interferometry. There are I don't remember how many, there are several smaller telescopes. And they are using it in a different mode. So in fact this is this is the this instrument VLT is used in combination with also with smaller telescope for observing uh, 
uh, other objects. I was I was uh, concentrated, of course, on the black hole in the center of our galaxy. Thank you very much. I think that this explains a lot. Yeah. So there, were, there are also some questions uh, you know, on the chat. And okay. One is a layman question, if I may ask, but I don't know. I understand that it was not asked yet, so. Layman question, I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, okay, so, uh, yeah, of course, I mean, I mean, a layman question, if I ask, but what is the question? Yes, I understand there is no question yet, so we wait for question. Is it another one. Ah, uh, will black holes vanish after some time if it is not pulling in the matter because yeah, okay, so this is probably, uh, okay, so probably somebody who, was, who came late uh, or have problems with, uh, with, with his computer, because as I said at the beginning, astrophysical black holes will not decay, and they are not decaying because the uh, radiation is unimportant, and they, uh, uh, they rather absorb radiation which is, the, which is filling the universe. Now, since you asked this question, and since I mentioned Roger Penrose, a great physicist, a great uh, mathematician, Roger Penrose has a theory, a cosmological theory, according to which the uh, universe evolves through cycles. And the cycles are very, very long. And uh, and he claims that before our eons, I think it's called eons, there was a previous eons. And as I told you, a solar mass black hole will decay after 10 to the 67 years. So at 10 to the 9, a, mil, a billion solar mass will detect, will detect uh, something 10 to the 80 or something. So since in the, in the Penrose cosmology, this is not a problem. He says that in previous eons, it lasted so long that all supermassive black holes decayed by emitting Hawking radiation. And they left traces that you could see now on the on the uh, cosmic radiation filling the universe, and he even has a collaborator. Sorry, he even has two collaborators in Warsaw, even who claim that you can that you can see such circles coming from the uh, uh, Hawking radiation from the previous eons. Uh, this 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 uh, of course considering. Uh, time scales of the order of 10 to the 80 years, which, okay, um, okay, I, I'm, I'm a bit too, uh, too modest to, to even think about it. But so the answer is that for an astrophysicist, an astronomer, they don't decay, they absorb. But if you wait long enough, maybe they will decay. I mean, if it is true, if you wait too long enough, uh, they will probably decay. But it is of no practical, I mean, no, uh, I don't mean practical in the everyday practice, but it is of no importance unless you believe in Penrose cosmology, which I think uh, there are only four or five people believing, but in this, but uh, it means nothing, you know. Uh, I don't know, I don't know how many people believe Copernicus, so. Uh, and question. then, uh, from a Levin point of view, is it possible that the whole world contains a black hole? Have you heard about the holographic? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, sure. Can be black hole with the size of elementary particles? Yeah. So the, the it is possible that the whole world. Yeah, there is there is a a, a hypothesis that we are inside a a black hole, I think it would rather be a, a white hole than a black hole. And the, uh, um, I, I would, okay, the answer, the honest answer would be, it is possible, but I don't, 
I don't understand this possibility. Okay, I don't want to be. I know that some people are concerned. I don't understand that. Uh, as you see, it's not it's not a shame to say I don't understand something. Now, have you heard about? Yeah, I've heard of course about the holographic uh, uh, principle, and of course it is related. In fact, it inspires. It is inspired by by the property of black holes because. But I didn't talk about it, of course, because the, the, there's a problem with black holes because since they swallow everything, they swallow all the information, which is embarrassing in, in classical physics, but it's not, it is not a deadly, but it is very unpleasant in quantum mechanics, where because the, the horizon, there's, not, there's nothing physical is happening there. You can cross, if you cross the horizon, you will be sorry, but not in the moment when you are crossing the horizon. So there is no interaction at the horizon. And it, so the quantum information could be lost in the black hole. And this is forbidden. And not only it could be lost forever, and then if, uh, if you look from the quantum point of view, the black hole would evaporate in the end, uh, if you if you are, for example, in a in a in a Penrose universe, and the information will be lost forever, which is forbidden by quantum mechanics. So there is a conflict between quantum mechanics, black hole, and Hawking radiation. So yes, I, uh, so what I think about it, I think there is a problem. I don't believe in the solution by. By Suskind, I don't believe in the solution by by uh, other people. I don't believe in firewalls. I think this problem will be solved by quantum gravity if one day we have quantum gravity. But it is true. I, of course, I'm aware of that that there is a problem, and I don't I don't have the solution to the problem, and I don't think anybody has a solution to the problem. And then, uh, can there be a black hole of the size of atomic particles? In principle, yes. There's, this is the the the, the uh, black holes. There is, is I told you there's a maximum mass for the for the a neutron star, or there's a maximum mass for a white dwarf. For the black holes, there is no minimum mass. There's a maximum. There is there is a a mass which is so-called the Planck mass, uh, for which quantum effects of gravity are supposed to happening. So we don't we don't really know uh, what is happening. So in, in fact, my my answer to your third question is we don't know because a a, a, a black hole the size of a, an elementary particle would could have. It depends on the elementary particle too, of course. So, but in principle, yes. I mean, it, uh, it's a, it. There is, let's say, we don't know of any physical law that would forbid it. In general, it could be a reason for this not to be. But on the other hand, the gravi gravitation plays no role. In uh, in the world of elementary particles. Uh, okay, can or can a black hole vanish after time? So I, I already answered that. Yes, both, uh, you're, you're welcome. And uh, okay, somebody says u mnie wszystko w porządku, so I'm very happy, but. Uh, Okay, thank you very much. I'm pleased. And if you have any other question, please answer. As, as you see, I they ask. This is a field where there are many answers. I cannot. There are many questions to which I cannot answer. I mean, can answer, but can tell you why I don't have the answer. At least. So. So it seems that there are no more questions now. So it is last chance. Last chance, yeah. It's... Otherwise, I I will say thank you very much, Jean Pierre, for presenting. Jakub, you wanted to ask? Yes, maybe I will rise. Uh, okay, so that. let you try to ask. Yeah, uh, that, that was a topic you mentioned that you wanted some question about. So 
maybe you could uh, say say us a word or two on the bosonic uh, stars. Sorry, I, the, the 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 sound is very. I, bosonic uh, stars. Yes, bosonic stars. Oh, bosonic. Oh, yes, 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 yes. yes. Okay, yeah. Uh, bos boson, so-called bosonic star, boson star that has been invented a long time ago, and they, are, uh, uh, they were in fact not stars at the beginning. They were they were objects uh, that were kept together by gravitation uh, made of bosons. Okay, they, let me say because maybe not everybody know uh, what are bosons. The matter. All matter in the universe is divided in two classes, bosons and fermions. Fermions, and, and they, are, they differ by spin. Spin is a quantum number characterizing the elementary particle. And uh, they are sort of a, uh, the, the, uh, the, the electrons, protons, neutrons, the matter that makes our world is made of, of uh, 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 particles with spin one half, uh, and they are fermions. And all the other particles, like the photon, uh, they have uh, if, uh, spin uh, equal to one. Uh, so there are these two, two classes of, uh, of particles, and we are made, and our world is made of uh, fermions and the fermions obey the so-called Pauli principle uh, that don't, do not allow them to be together in the, in the same state. That's why we exist, because we cannot be squeezed to, 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 to some elementary state. That's why uh, solid state exists, star exists, we exist. But bosons, they can be all put together uh, in, in, in some condensate and theoretically, it seems to be interesting to, to see if you can make a, a, a star from bosons. And some bosons can, bosons can to be all together. You could think, you know, there was, you was, if you squeeze them by gravitation, they will get just to one point. But this is forgetting the Heisenberg principle, that you cannot put anything to quantum quantum mechanically to one point. So the bosons stars are interesting objects because they are kept by the by the Heisenberg principle. This this is what creates sort of a pressure. You squeeze them but at the end uh, they uh, if this uh, Heisenberg principle uh, uncertainty principle creates pressure. And then people started to add uh, some interaction to them, and then it was found some connection with dark matter. And some people created objects um, that called boson stars. So they are, they are very massive, and they are made mostly of bosons, so they uh, a non-radiative boson. So they are, they are like black holes, but they don't have a surface, but they are not black holes. So could they exist? They could exist, but could they exist in the center of the galaxy? You have a dark object in the center of the galaxy or in the, in the uh, M87. The problem with this dark object is that it is gravitating, so it attracts matter. The matter goes into the bottom stars and accumulates, and then we radiate. You see the difference between black hole and boson stars that if matter falls into black hole, it's finished. If it falls into the into a boson stars, it will be still visible. So uh, they could exist, but you have to explain why they don't radiate after all the time they've spent their accreting matter, because we know they are accreting matter. And that is why uh, when will we have a, a better resolution, for example, in the millimeter uh, interferometry, they want to launch in space uh, radio telescope, then we will be able to tell the difference between boson stars and, neutral, and, and black holes. For now, we, we are not uh, yet able to do that. So uh, boson stars, they are the only sort of competition for supermassive black holes because they can be supermassive. Bottom stars, 
but uh, they will be easy to eliminate in the future. And of course, nobody's ever seen a, uh, a boson star. And I predict nobody will ever see, but that's another story. Yes, and the scenario for formation is a bit problematic, probably. No, but if they are dark matter, they have they share the same problem with formation. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. So thank you very, very much for this uh, inspiring, interesting talk. Uh, thank you for thank you for for listening to me. There were nearly two hundred people uh, uh, during the talk, so even now there are, there is one hundred forty. Yeah. So I, I don't know. know I don't know that people are really. It, really, it, it uh, must be must be the pandemics. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for time. inviting me and. Uh, we will uh, will communicate about the about the uh, 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 lecture. I mean the, the not lecture, reading. Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course. Uh, so I I invite also everyone for the next month seminar. Will where uh, people from Canada will talk about how to use Google Maps to. Uh, uh, predict early symptoms of Alzheimer uh, in oh, so. people. So it is some interesting uh, science developed now in the. World. I will say I will certainly connect. Oh, okay, so you are invited. So bye bye for today. Okay. Bye bye to everyone. Thank you very much.